I think a version of the movie could have been done 10 or 15 years ago, but uh, not, not as uh, sophisticatedly and at a greater, greater cost, I imagine. Uh, there are things we can do now with visual effects that, that couldn't uh, be done a long time ago. And uh, ways we can combine uh, physical human beings, organic creatures, with visual effects. Uh, extend things and manipulate things. And that's the real challenge here. We're not creating digital characters. And we're not blowing up many buildings. We're, 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 we're really enhancing uh, physical human beings in, in a way. Actual real creatures, real actors, real people. You know, I really think the major responsibility of a visual effects supervisor is to help the director tell the story. Um, just like produ production designers and cinematographers, we have to work with the director to make sure that the to story the director's trying to tell and the vision that's being conveyed in the movie is unified and works all together to support that. And, uh, and I don't think most people think of visual effects supervisors as anything more than technicians. I mean, most people think of us as somebody who says, oh no, you can't do that because that's too bright or that's too dark or this is, we'll never be able to put that together, you can't do that. Um, and in fact, that's really, that's an important part of our job and that part comes from experience. But the, the part that's critical to what we do is to be able to creatively come up with ideas for sequences that will tell the story object we're photographing today, we hope, shooting, is uh, the interior of the torch of the Statue of Liberty after Magneto has installed his machine in the torch. And he's captured Rogue and placed her in the machine. We previously photographed Rogue in front of a blue screen acting as if she's captured and held in the machine. And we're now about to shoot the machine starting to spin and tearing the skin of the torch apart in the process. Um, so we built a miniature which is a little less than half scale uh, of the real torch and have a very large mechanism and heavily built hoops, we call them hoops. Um, to tear through a tearaway effects rigged skin. And the skin that'll be behind the hoops looks, will look like the interior of the skin that forms the torch on the Statue of Liberty. This will become the background plate to go behind Rogue, who was shot blue screen. Rogue camera. Okay, action! Action! Roll camera! Hey, action! Good! And play it back. That was weird. I don't know if I like it. That was kicking out the Check your lights. What happened is uh, one of the lamps got bumped and hit, yeah, and hit the, right, the, the right on the uh, yeah. shower head. But you still, th I think you still have some. All we need is. Uh, oh, just have oh, it. <laughs> yeah, well, we're at 48 frames in the lighting. That happened right. I mean, I have no idea how that happened. Okay, well, well that's fine. <laughs> that's good. We're good. We are using just about every technique there is available right now because that's the kind of film it is. It's about the X-Men. The X-Men all have different powers. Storm can control the weather. Cyclops has the beams he shoots from his eyes. Um, Magneto can bend metal and contort things and fly because he can use his magnetic power to resist other metallic elements and raise himself in the air. You know, Logan slash Wolverine has claws. Rogue can very subtly steal other people's powers or their life force. If she was to stick around long, touch them long enough, she could, you know, they could die. And we're certainly using it all, and the list is pretty long, so I don't think I have to get into that. Um, but, uh, but I think we're taking an approach which is 
maybe unique these days in terms of of telling a story when you're dealing with big action heroes. There are uh, a number of times in the movie when Mystique transforms into other characters. And uh, we're trying very hard here to not do a two-dimensional, for lack of a better term, morph. Um, and many morphs, even when they're three-dimensional, look it's not much different than a two-dimensional morph because you're simply taking one object which is two-dimensional on film and replacing it with another other object which is two-dimensional on film. And you can do some strange shape shifts and things to try to give it a 3D feel, but generally, you know, it looks like a morph. A morph is a spatial transformation as opposed to a dissolve, the traditional film technique, which is a temporal transition, just happens over time and morphs are spatial in which two different shapes are brought into congruence so that one shape and the other shape fit together and then the surface is changed. And it's traditionally done uh, as a two-dimensional technique where you create a, essentially a mesh that fits over each of the different characters you're doing and you bring the two meshes into alignment. And then when you animate the two meshes and they're pulling the image together, it looks like you're transitioning from one image to another, but it's only working on the filmed image. It's not working on the image in three dimensions. But what we had to do here with Mystique was create an effect, because she grows scales, because she really is Bobby, including his clothes, his wristwatch, his eyeglasses, if he had eyeglasses, whatever he's got on his body is created by Mystique. So. You know, unlike uh, some other films where if she, you may see her transform and she'd still be wearing his clothes, she creates the clothes as well. That's what she can do. So as he walks forward, he has to change in size and shape in profile to us. And he also has to propagate scales, but these work in three dimensions. They come out on the sides of his arms, they come out in the foreground of his arms. So there's a 3D model which has to move in perfect sync with his model. And then his model has to be shape-shifted to match her model. These all have to be brought together. So it's truly, um, the work is truly being done in three dimensions. It's not just working on the film surface. We're creating these people in CG and then using the filmed elements to get us from point A to point B. But in this case, point B is fully CG. The only thing that's not CG at the end of this shot is the hallway. This is our Mystique to Bobby transformation. And uh, here's our database of Bobby. And this is prior to be putting into the, our track. So this is essentially the effect taking place, our 3D morph. Um, and as we cycle through, only certain pieces of them transform and become mystique. And as we cycle through, it slowly becomes, uh, Bobby starts turning into Mystique. It starts getting different body shape. <laughs> so this is our 3D database, shaded. Um, this is phase one of the effect where we do the actual shape shift. Phase two is when we get it into the, the track and then we apply her scale animation to it, which is all 3D animated uh, geometry. She has something like, I think, I think we're close to about 8,000 scales on her body. And to animate all those scales at once would be a very time consuming process. So using luminance values that we extract from these maps, which become the texture maps, where it drives a cycle animation on the scales. So basically, as it's wiping down our body, it triggers the animation of the scales just flying out. I'm a big fan of um, practical effects. Um, uh, you know, CGI I think is cool, but I think is, if you use it as 
sparingly as possible and only when you need to. And I was, you know, and they're like, well, but you wouldn't have had an optic blast if it wasn't for CGI. I, was like, I know, but, you know, um, but I think it looks cool. I think it was great. I, I think it was, it was good that, that he could, um, uh, that there was a range to it, that, you know, that like it could be this concussive beam of force that could blow the roof off of a train station and also be, you know, you know, razor thin. The beam has the force of a hugely powerful flow of water. It is not a laser beam. It doesn't blow things up by heat or any kind of incendiary action. It blows things up by the force of itself hitting them. It's like hitting somebody, blasting somebody with a series of cannonballs. <clears throat> so in the train station, when he's in the train station, where we earlier did some video coverage of us blowing up the train station roof, Suspense. What next? Roll it. Action. Uh, cut it, please. Mm, it slow. Slow. What? It looked great, but it was just slow. <laughs> so this is the element that when he first opens his eyes, this is the element we're using to bring the colors of red and white and the heat, feeling of heat and the feeling of forward propulsion uh, out of his eyes. It's an element that looks like this. Um, when the element hits the ceiling, uh, it, when the beam hits the ceiling, it splashes just like water would splash against the ceiling and spread sideways. So uh, Teresa and Thad built some geometry to create um, an artificial ceiling, essentially, and then splash uh, with particle animation, this, get this kind of a, of, a, of a shape, as if the beam is hitting the ceiling. Right here against black, it looks flat. When you see it against the ceiling, it feels more like it's heading in the direction it should go. Particles are what a lot of CG, a lot of people use to create uh, procedural animation. Yeah, natural and phenomenon like falling water, right. smoke. Dynamics um, of different sorts. Fire sometimes. Um, yeah, dynamics that, that you can't get by, create, by actually creating a piece of geometry and warping or stretching or or manipulating that geometry, so mm -hmm. you uh, identify essentially individual pixels which have a path and they're definable by their velocity, by their mass, by you can apply all kinds of attributes to the particles depending on the kind of effect you want. Right, and in this one we've attached uh, blobbies, they call them, which is basically uh, in this case something that would look more liquidy, more uh, molten and such, and so that when it hit the particles are driving it to the shape of the room, but uh, what's attached to each particle, which is just a location, uh, would be a blobby or basically a, a jelly ball. <laughs> and it would, they all glom together as they get close and they'll separate as they spread apart. And uh, again, just trying to push the idea of uh, liquid. The thing about Mike is he really clicked with Brian on the fact that Mike's effects have always been seamless and real. And you can never tell what's an effect in a Mike Fink movie. And that was the number one concern for us coming in. And he goes, and these claws go in slow motion. This will be the effect shot. Right. And then. And we have a lot of shots where the where the actors are wearing these, which are Logan's claws, and they really have to be made to look the same. Gee, the lighting in here is not bad. And uh, so uh, it becomes the job of uh, Thad and Joel Merritt here, and I don't know who else is on the claw crew, uh, uh, to both track the hands in three dimensions so that the claws don't look like that, 
that would be bad, you know, uh, or that would be bad, you know, or even worse would be that, you know. So the claws have to look like they, they fit on the ends of the knuckles and stay there, stay put. And then they have to match the lighting. And quite a few of the cuts in this film, uh, in this particular sequence, are practical claws intercut with the CG claws. So the lighting and the animation has to be absolutely precise. In this shot, there were practical blade tips already poking out of her back. And he had little stubby blades on here. And the shot was never originally meant to show the retraction. The retraction was going to be off screen. So uh, what Teresa and Jamie and Thad and whoever else worked on this shot did, it's a real effort, um, was to remove the practical blade tips that stuck out of the back and replace them with these CG ones that retract, animate the blades retracting into Logan's fist here, and animate a displacement down Logan's arm so you felt that the blades are running through. If you see this on film, you can see this much more clearly. So as the blades retract, you see that displacement run down the arm, and you get a real sense of that motion back. Without seeing that on the arm, you get you almost don't see it move because of, the, of how it works. Um, so it took quite a bit of back and forth to get that animation to work right and get the timing right because his motion, he makes a little recoil motion so you really know when you have to start the retraction. But as you can see, he's, it's almost two beats. He goes, and then it's like two beats. So you have to make all of that work with, with uh, Hughes acting. And, uh, and then, of course, light it and do all the things you have to do to make it look like it belongs in the scene. I love to be challenged on a film. I love the excitement of being presented with the, you know, Mike, we need to shoot this and how do we do it? And coming up with a way to shoot it that, you know, that works for the film. Um, and, uh, and this film certainly has its, you know, its share of major challenges on a daily basis.